So, uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's uh, my pleasure to be here. Thanks to uh, Professor uh, Dominelli that uh, I have um, the opportunity here to speak about the environmental protection uh, during armed conflicts. Um, it is indeed uh, a very exciting and uh, more or less recent uh, topic which uh, came up and I would like to give you an idea of uh, where it comes from and uh, why it is of interest to the international community nowadays. Um, I would like to, just before we start uh, with, the, uh, uh, with the topic itself, I would like to give you a short uh, overview of where I basically come from. Uh, well, Stefano just uh, explained a little. But uh, uh, as he said, it's uh, quite some, some time ago when I uh, started to uh, uh, look into IHL uh, uh, in the, uh, well, mid-late 1990s. Uh, well, environment wasn't um, of, um, well, a big issue at that time, you could say. And, um, I had the, uh, the opportunity in uh, 1999 to go to uh, Nairobi to the United Nations Environment Program for a research uh, internship uh, and to, uh, well, to do research on, on this very issue. Um, basically, when we recall uh, the uh, 1990s, um, that was influenced a lot on discussions regarding the uh, uh, Kosovo war uh, after the uh, 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 Yugoslav wars, you could say. Uh, and uh, at that time, uh, UNEP also sent out a task force uh, to find out or to, to do some fact-finding about the environmental consequences of, um, of this war. Um, I had the uh, uh, pleasure of um, doing some simulations during the UNEP, uh, UNEP's fourth global training program in environmental law, uh, which was quite a challenge because, um, well, the uh, participants were usually um, state representatives uh, on a, well, st starting level, you could say. Uh, nevertheless, uh, very serious, very um, well concentrated on um, uh, well state and uh, government positions, and uh, well nowadays it um, it is a different situation where we have a lot of other players in international law. You've heard probably a lot on um, well beyond states. Uh, um, uh, states as actors in international law, a lot also on uh, international organizations. You've heard about NGOs, uh, participation of civil society. That was not the case at that time. And uh, states were very serious about um, others uh, interfering, you could say, in their sovereignty and uh, their um, understanding or interpretation, you could say, uh, of international law. So uh, it was quite a challenge to take up such controversial uh, topics like um, um, environmental protection in time of armed conflict, as well as in environmental security. So these were the two issues I was dealing with uh, during my stay in, in East Africa. Um, I've published and I've also uh, um, written my PhD thesis on this issue. So uh, that is basically my, my, my background. And when I came back to, uh, to Europe or to Germany, I was, um, um, well, um, able to, uh, to give some, some lectures over a, a period of time from 2000 to 2006 in, in Dresden on a, a very interesting course on environmental management, basically for uh, um, uh, developing countries in countries in transition. So that was uh, a, a different um, audience, you could say, very eager, very willing to discuss those issues and also um, a bit more, more or less because of they were somehow um, affected 
by conflicts and the results of conflicts. And this is also something we are going to, to uh, discuss perhaps today. Uh, at least I would like to explain that to you. Well, just as a short overview uh, uh, with regard to my, my professional background, I'm a professor of international law at the University of Applied Sciences in, in Bremerhaven since uh, two, 2007. Um, I've also, um, I'm also a managing partner and founder uh, or co-founder of um, the uh, Hugo Grotius, uh, which is a, a non-profit uh, society uh, for the advancement of uh, legal sciences, uh, which uh, uh, has nowadays also um, special consultative status as an NGO with uh, ECOSOC of the United Nations and also uh, a special, um, sorry, <laughs> observer status with UNEP uh, since, uh, since last year. So this is basically as a short introduction and uh, uh, I would uh, like to start uh, by looking into the overall framework, you could say, from a what, more or less uh, historical point of view in order to understand uh, the, um, uh, the setting, you could say, and also then to uh, explain what is the difference between uh, the approach to environmental protection in time of armed conflicts in the beginning and over the uh, last, uh, basically, uh, two, three decades, um, uh, or even longer now, uh, uh, with regard to this uh, topic. I would like to draw your attention particularly to the Second Indochina War because uh, this is one of the um, uh, starting points, you could say, of the effects uh, of, uh, um, you could say, uh, envi environmental harm, you could say, or damage to the environment because of an armed conflict, uh, which draw the attention of the international community and which led then to uh, basically first codification um, uh, activities on the international level. We will look into that a little closer without uh, um, well, being too dogmatic and I promise I'm not going to uh, uh, go too much in detail with regard to the um, uh, legal provisions. We, were, uh, we are going to look into s some provisions but only uh, for the sake of um, clarity, where we started and where we are now. So um, that's as a, as a first uh, disclaimer, you could say, with regard to this uh, presentation. We do have the uh, two Gulf Wars, you could say, which were the next um, um, milestones uh, with regard to the, um, well, understanding of the international community. Uh, with regard to the importance of, uh, of this very issue. Uh, and uh, as I've already mentioned, the Yugoslav Wars and the Kosovo War uh, were the next uh, important steps um, uh, also to understand that there is a need to deal with this uh, issue and, uh, uh, well, not to close uh, your eyes um, with regard to the consequences uh, of war. Um, We'll also slightly touch uh, also different dimensions at a later stage of the presentation, but first of all, we are concentrating on the consequences, you could say, of an armed conflict with regard to uh, environmental damage. Well, and uh, obviously we are in a, in a uh, very special setting nowadays as well, even though, of course, uh, international and uh, non-international armed conflicts have been in place uh, since, well, well, humans are on this, on this planet, I believe. Um, still, we are in a special situation, and uh, you all know, uh, particularly from media coverage about the uh, environmental damage occurring uh, uh, on the territory uh, of, uh, of Ukraine uh, nowadays. Um, well, I'm not going into uh, the uh, uh, Ukraine uh, uh, or the war against, 
against Ukraine uh, too much uh, today, particularly since uh, the fact-finding is still ongoing. And, uh, well, as an international lawyer, even though, uh, well, broadly focused, you could say, or with a broader perspective, I, I tend to wait for, uh, for uh, facts before discussing or uh, dealing with the uh, legal consequences out of that. But I will give some indications of what we will have to discuss uh, once uh, the, uh, the war is over. So this is uh, just the, the, the setting, you could say, uh, uh, for our, our topic. Um, the next um, level, you could say, uh, with regard to the setting uh, is um, uh, the, well, are the, the instruments of uh, IHL um, regarding environmental protection. And I would like to make a differentiation, you could say, uh, which is, uh, uh, in my case, uh, basically threefolded. Uh, this is pre-Stockholm, uh, post-Stockholm, and uh, recent developments. And uh, since you are, uh, well, not law students, and uh, I don't know if you have had any uh, classes or courses uh, 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 before, in environmental law or environment-related uh, issues uh, uh, in general. I would like to uh, make a few comments, if you allow, uh, with regard to what is Stockholm, because if, uh, that might, uh, uh, might not uh, be uh, uh, so obvious. So uh, the United Nations uh, Conference on the Human Environment, uh, which took place in 1972, was, uh, this is at least how, how we usually say in interna international environmental law, the um, um, uh, birth of international environmental law. So uh, basically with uh, 1972, uh, the international community uh, took up the, uh, uh, well, environmental issues uh, on the international agenda. And that was an important step because if, uh, uh, you might have heard that there were, um, um, well, there were provisions on the protection of the environment uh, uh, already before that. Um, you've explained, I, I'm specialized in the, in the law of the sea. So for example, uh, if you think about um, uh, environmental uh, or marine environmental protection, you had already in the in the 1940s you had uh, first provisions on the protection of the marine environment, um, but that is uh, um, not uh, what I what I uh, mean by saying the birth of uh, international environmental law. Uh, 1972 is uh, really the fundamental start of a, a, an international conscious, you could say, of an understanding of the international community with regard to the importance of, um, uh, of the protection and preservation uh, of uh, the environment. Well, we have to see also in this context uh, the, um, um, the historical background. And uh, if you think about the 1960s, uh, which is the time of the decolonialization and uh, the uh, um, uh, coming up of new state actors, um, we see that uh, uh, the uh, concept of Europe, you could say, uh, was uh, uh, um, uh, fading away and uh, the uh, uh, international community was growing uh, by new state actors, uh, meaning that uh, um, former colonies gained their uh, independence and sovereignty and uh, um, had their ideas, their experiences, and uh, also their expectations towards uh, international law. And that meant uh, that they also, um, uh, well, requested for certain uh, regulations and understandings that came up in, in Stockholm, uh, even though they were um, actually not represented, 
uh, they didn't, didn't show up. Um, the so-called group of 77 uh, were forming, uh, but they didn't, uh, uh, but they didn't um, influence uh, Stockholm by their presence, but basically they influenced by their not being present, you could say. Uh, so that was something uh, we will see when we look into the uh, instruments uh, mentioned here in this, in this context. So basically, this is the um, historical setting uh, with regard to IHL uh, related to the environment. In 2001, um, we uh, have a de decision of the UN General Assembly with regard uh, to an uh, uh, international day for preventing the exploitation of the environment in war and armed conflict. Well, you can say, well, what, what, what is the importance of such an international day? We have uh, a lot of them. Uh, they regularly pop up. And uh, um, well, we have it on, on various uh, numerous issues, actually, on uh, the uh, UN calendar. But um, I would like to draw your attention uh, to the importance of such international days because they also reflect the conscious or the understanding of the international community. Um, and uh, 2001 uh, is... Uh, shortly uh, after the uh, 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 after the uh, um, uh, uh, Yugoslav and Kosovo wars, as well as uh, shortly after the Millennium uh, Summit, which uh, also made clear that this is a, a, an important issue uh, to deal with uh, by the international community. So uh, I would say uh, it the International Day itself doesn't make a, a big change, but it is a very important indication of the understanding of the international community with regard to this very and very special topic at that time. Oh, sorry. Um... I'm not going to discuss all these uh, uh, instruments. It is only to, uh, to give you uh, uh, an understanding that these are um, uh, instruments on the methods and means of warfare uh, which are uh, related or somehow related to the environment. But since we do have uh, more special, specialized um, uh, or more focused uh, instruments, we will concentrate on that and we also have a uh, limited time to deal with that but uh, just to give you a short overview here uh, and I've also um, sorry I don't know so um, so first as I promised uh, I will just uh, look into very few provisions, uh, uh, and I'm not going to bore you too much in uh, dogmatics, but um, as I said, I, I would like to, to show you the uh, uh, development um, uh, from, let's uh, take the Hague Convention number four, respecting the laws and customs of war on land from 1907, um, which says in article 23G, it forbids to destroy or seize the enemy's property unless such destruction or seizure be imperatively demanded by the necessities of war. So this is basically uh, how IHL approached, uh, um, uh, well, the, uh, well, somehow the, to regulate uh, um, the time of an armed conflict. But that is, of course, uh, um, a, well, is a very, uh, from a, today's view, a very restricted view, of course, with regard to, to environment. And I've uh, uh, given here some, some uh, uh, cons, you could say. So it does not prohibit the destruction of the environment itself, but addresses the destruction of, of property. 
um, the, uh, it has an anthropocentric view. Uh, global commons are not covered. Global commons, let's take, well, um, Antarctica, uh, high seas. So this is something which uh, is uh, beyond uh, national jurisdiction, you could say. Uh, the uh, prohibition is subordinated to the principle of military necessity, which allows greater scope of subjective interpretation by the military. So this is, um, you can see, um, for, for the protection of the environment, uh, not of the, uh, uh, is, has not a strong case, you could say. So we will have to deal with uh, uh, others and we will look into, um, sorry, we will look into uh, Geneva law as well. And that is uh, the Geneva Convention number four relative to the uh, protection of civilian persons in time of war. And there we do have uh, two articles which are of uh, importance in this context. And you can see that it has basically uh, the same uh, um, uh, cons as, uh, the, uh, um, as the Hague Convention, since it is, and this is not, uh, well, a criticism regarding the, the instruments themselves, but more that it is the understanding of the international community of that time. So uh, we do have uh, an understanding that the environment is only uh, to be protected in the context of, of property perspectives. So environment as a property should be protected they haven't thought about beyond that. We'll come to that in a minute. As I've explained, when, when you, uh, if you recall the slide on the, uh, on the historical uh, development and the conflicts I've shown, uh, if you think about uh, the uh, uh, Vietnam War, uh, we are uh, speaking in this context of uh, the uh, UN Convention on the Prohibition of Military or any other uh, 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 use of environmental modification techniques. And this is something which is of uh, particular interest because of, uh, uh, Vietnam showed uh, a different dimension, a new dimension, you could say, of, of warfare and uh, that also affected a lot uh, the uh, environment or damaged the environment. And uh, uh, I've given here the, uh, the uh, two most important articles which are of uh, importance in the uh, NMOD convention, but I would like to draw your attention also to the um, uh, remarks I have on the NMOD convention. And uh, uh, you can see it is already a, a shift uh, to, towards a, um, a, a positive um, development with regard to the environment. You have to recall again, 1972, Stockholm, the international community took up the issue of, uh, of uh, uh, the environment, still very much focused on the relationship between environment and the human being, not necessarily property, but as a, it has to be somehow close to it. So we were speaking about uh, the United Nations Conference on the Human Environment. So this is the, the idea or the, 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 the protection on the human environment. So um, the ANMOD Convention does not require uh, an armed conflict. It bans the use of the environment as a, as a weapon. Um, and uh, the uh, techniques must have um, the effect described in the threshold, Article 1. And uh, the importance is because of that will come, well, all over again uh, uh, with regard to IHL, even, even in, uh, in the very most recent developments, you have uh, the, the threshold widespread, long-lasting, severe effects. And you will always have to look on if it says 
and or if it says or. So there are even nowadays different combinations which we will uh, learn in a, in a few minutes and uh, uh, to see what is important uh, with regard to the differentiation on, on these very small words, you could say. As a con, or as cons, we do have never or rarely applied methods of warfare. So uh, as, you, as you might know, uh, during the uh, uh, Second Indochina War, uh, there were um, methods and means of warfare um, uh, used, which are really rare. For example, uh, artificial rainmaking or artificial earthquakes. You uh, might know the uh, uh, bash words like uh, Agent Orange or Agent Blue in this uh, regard. Um, and that makes it a, a little weaker, of course. But NMOD is still uh, on vogue and is an important convention. Um, so the international community is still working on um, uh, getting others, uh, um, uh, well, adopting it or ratifying it. Uh, the pro uh, prohibition only addresses the deliberate manipulation of the environment, which means the unintended destruction is not covered. So this is uh, uh, a weak point, you could say. In, this, in the context, we also have to see the additional protocols. So we are uh, in... Uh, uh, Geneva law, we are uh, 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 well, uh, basically uh, uh, here in the context of, uh, of Geneva, uh, Geneva law rather than uh, Hague law, but that we can uh, perhaps also discuss at a, at a, a later stage of this um, uh, well, presentation today. I would like to draw your attention to the uh, two most uh, important uh, articles which uh, we have in, in the um, additional protocols, uh, Article 35, Subsection 3, and Article 55, Subsection 1. And uh, uh, I have uh, highlighted, you could say, uh, the uh, last part of Article 55, um, uh, here because of uh, it says and thereby to prejudice the health or survival of the population. So when we look into the remarks uh, again, uh, we do have uh, some more pros here on, uh, on the uh, pros and cons side, you could say. Uh, so uh, it prohibits all means and methods of warfare being expected to cause environmental destruction above the threshold of Article 35, subsection 3 and 55 uh, of the additional Protocol 1. Um, and um, uh, it is the first uh, treaty ever uh, in IHL explicitly addressing uh, environment. So this is an important uh, step, step. And as I said, uh, environment not in the context uh, necessarily as, as property. Um, it is, I wasn't sure if I should put that uh, 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 in here already, but just to give you a, a feeling for the uh, development uh, in this, in this uh, context, it is slightly intrinsic approach uh, in uh, Article 35, subsection 3, meaning that we are, um, um, uh, well, on our way towards protecting the environment for its own sake, you could say, without thinking of a uh, human environment, without thinking of property, without any relation to, uh, uh, well, the human element, you could say. But that is very early to say in this context. So this is why I say slightly, slightly. So, um, and we do have uh, no subordination to the principle of uh, military necessity, which is uh, an important uh, uh, issue. Uh, well, a pro 
which is still, if you see the names, of course, uh, of those states uh, as, a, as a pro, uh, is that only a few states are not party to the protocols, um, even though one has to say or admit that it is a, um, a, a pity that uh, particularly uh, um, uh, um, such important uh, uh, states, also military-wise, are not um, member to uh, uh, well to the uh, uh, additional protocols. As uh, uh, cons, we do have the anthropocentric view in Article 55. I've mentioned uh, this when I said I've highlighted the last part of Article 55. Uh, the threshold is higher than in NMOD. Uh, this is what I've uh, indicated already now, focusing on the OR or AND um, point. And we do have here a, a, a cumulative uh, situation. So widespread long-term and severe damage is required by the additional protocols. And there is actually no definition of the term natural environment uh, nor the criteria determining the, the threshold. So that makes it uh, rather difficult to apply uh, to uh, enforce basically the additional protocols in this, in this regard. Well, now we are leaving basically the codification level of uh, IHL with regard to the uh, protection of the environment. And I would like to uh, draw your attention to the, uh, well, second source of international law important in this context, and this is uh, customary international law or customary IHL. Um, nowadays, it's, it's rather easy to access um, uh, the, uh, this information. And uh, I've, I've given here uh, two examples of how to access, and I'm not sure if uh, you all have uh, the, the app of the ICRC uh, with regard to uh, the sources of IHL, which is nice to have. Well, probably you don't need it for, for evening chats or so, but still it's uh, uh, nice to have access all the time on, uh, on, these, uh, on these sources. So perhaps just as a, as a, a, a nice, nice gimmick, you could say, but still the um, uh, uh, IHL uh, database by the ICRC or the International Committee of the Red Cross is, uh, is really uh, worth uh, looking, looking into it. So um, just as a recommendation. In this context, I would like uh, to uh, um, uh, mention or highlight also the uh, ICRC study on uh, customary international humanitarian law with implications on the environment. Uh, these are the rules 43 to 45, and we will look into them um, just, to, uh, uh, just to get an idea. Now, okay, so rule 43, the application of general principles on uh, the conduct of hostilities to the natural environment, says uh, the general principles on the conduct of hostilities apply to the natural environment. No part of the natural environment may be attacked unless it is a military objective. Um, B, destruction of any part of the natural environment is prohibited unless required by imperative military necessity. And uh, C, launching an attack against a military objective which may be expected to cause incidental damage to the environment which would be excessive in relation to the concrete and direct military advantage anticipated is prohibited. So. Basically, you all uh, know those um, um, uh, uh, those uh, um, uh, features here from the uh, from the principles which I uh, um, mentioned here at the bottom of the of the slide. 
principle of uh, distinction, the military necessity, and the principle of proportionality. So basically, as I said, uh, those, um, uh, those rules of the ICRC are not formulating something new, but rather to, uh, well, make it uh, easier to access, you could say, to have a better and easier overview. Rule 44, due regard for the natural environment in military operations, uh, which reads methods and means of warfare must be employed with due regard to the protection and preservation of the natural environment in the conduct of military operations, all feasible precautions must be taken to avoid and in any event to minimize incidental damage to the environment lack of scientific certainty as to the effects of the environment, um, on the environment, sorry, of, the cert of certain military operations does not absolve uh, a party to the conflict from taking such precautions. So uh, the precautionary principle is something which um, was developed in the international environmental law and which was uh, implemented also into uh, IHL in this, uh, in this context. And you can say that, uh, of course, uh, within international law, and you have seen the uh, strong interrelationships, uh, uh, the uh, interconnections, you could say, between the different fields, uh, no matter if it is uh, um, uh, IHL, uh, uh, international environmental law, or public international law in general, is of course uh, 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 obvious here and uh, does play an important role in the development of uh, um, those fields of law. And uh, last but not least, we have rule 45, causing serious damage to the natural environment, which reads the use of methods and means or means of warfare that are intended or may be expected to cause widespread long-term and severe damage to the natural environment is prohibited. Destruction of the natural environment may not be used as a weapon. So uh, this is basically uh, the uh, other three rules which uh, uh, the ICRC in its study, um, um, well, wrote down uh, to give an idea of uh, uh, the uh, situation of customary international law uh, with regard to IHL and environmental protection. Um, we do have um, uh, some jurisprudence on this uh, issue. I'm not going to, uh, 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 not going to go into detail too much. I just wanted to uh, give you a, a slight idea of uh, how that is uh, of importance and how that also um, makes a difference uh, with regard to the international community or the approach of the international community, you could say. And uh, if we read, for example, uh, para 33 of the ICJ advisory opinion on the illegality of the threat or use of nuclear weapons, uh, it reads, the court thus finds that while the existing international law relating to the protection and safeguarding of the environment does not specifically prohibit the use of nuclear weapons, it indicates important environmental factors that are properly to be taken into account in the context of the implementation of the principles and rules of law applicable in armed conflict. Okay, that is something I think you have already uh, uh, explained a little about this, uh, uh, about this case, so you are somehow familiar with that. Um, I would like to draw your attention uh, to the effect, basically, of uh, this decision. Because, as it says, um, uh, existing international law um, does not prohibit the use of nuclear weapons. And uh, this is why I, uh, in this context, uh, mentioned here the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons from uh, 2017, which by now, since uh, 2021, is, uh, is in force. Um, and uh, uh, when we uh, read into the preamble, 
uh, in, in para 9, it says, um, basing themselves on the principles and rules of international humanitarian law, in particular the principle that the right of parties to an armed conflict to choose methods and means of warfare is not unlimited, and the rules for the protection of the natural environment. Basically, uh, the international community uh, uh, had the understanding that there is a need to codify uh, this, what the ICJ was saying, existing international law does not provide a prohibition, now it exists. Well, of course, it is only binding on those states member to this or to this treaty, obviously. And we do have, of course, um, uh, um, uh, 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 constant objectives, you could say, uh, not willing to be bound by this treaty and which uh, well, 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 they, they will probably not in the near future become members to this treaty, but still it is something which is already in place. And as you know, um, this might, might end up in becoming a more binding um, rule um, in customary international law and perhaps even beyond that. So we'll see, it's an important uh, first step towards uh, a more um, broad, uh, um, uh, well, uh, prohibition uh, internationally. I would also like to uh, go beyond jurisprudence and uh, to uh, make you familiar with some of the soft law instruments, um, which I don't know if, if uh, you are uh, uh, familiar with, uh, with those um, uh, uh, already, uh, but perhaps not really in the context of the environment, so I would like to uh, make some, um, um, or uh, I would like to, to mention some of them here at least. Um, and uh, uh, one of the, the first ones you could say in 1982 is uh, the World Charter for Nature, which is uh, part of the, or, uh, of the UN General Assembly resolution. Uh, and in, in para 20, it says military activities damaging to uh, nature shall be avoided. So this is basically one of the uh, uh, very early um, uh, well mentionings uh, of uh, of environmental protection or uh, protection of of nature uh, in uh, in uh, armed, armed conflicts, you could say, or military activities, as it says here um, uh, after after Stockholm. Uh, which uh, uh, did not uh, take up the, the, the issue at that time. So 82 is basically a, a good starting point with regard to uh, environmental protection in time of armed conflict. So uh, you can see already in this, in this uh, framework, you have 72, 82, and 92. You have uh, the Rio conference, which is uh, um, the next important step uh, two decades after, after Stockholm, uh, dealing already with two principles with uh, our issue here. Um, principle 24, uh, reads, warfare is inherently destructive of sustainable development. States shall therefore respect international law, providing protection for the environment in times of armed conflict and cooperate in its further development as necessary. And principle 26, uh, which reads, states shall resolve all their environmental disputes peacefully and by appropriate means in accordance with the Charter of the United Nations. So, well, basically, uh, um, uh, Principle 26 is a repetition of, uh, of, the, of the Charter, you could say, but it's important uh, to mention that here in this, in this context. And 24 
uh, as you can uh, see, is uh, uh, of vital importance for the uh, development of, uh, of an environmental protection uh, during armed conflicts. We do have a first um, uh, UN General uh, Assembly resolution, primarily or uh, really in its title, uh, on the protection of the environment in times of armed conflict in 1993. So uh, uh, also here, uh, influenced by the developments at the uh, United Nations conference, uh, yeah, conference on. Um, Sustain, uh, on, on development, on environment and development, sorry, uh, in, in Rio, uh, which is, uh, um, um, if you think about the wording uh, from 72, uh, now speaking about uh, uh, the environment, uh, not uh, as a human environment any longer, and it is connecting environment to development. So it sees there is somehow a relationship we will see uh, this relationship in a more prominent way when we uh, look just sh shortly on the issue of environmental security, um, just in, in a few minutes. And uh, we do also have the resolutions by the United Nations Environment uh, Assembly uh, of the United Nations Environment Programme, which uh, I would like to look s somehow more in detail right now. Uh, before um, uh, uh, we, we look into, um, well, the most recent uh, resolution on our issue uh, by um, uh, United Nations uh, Environment uh, Assembly, I would like to um, uh, explain a little uh, the, uh, um, well, coming into existence, you could say, on the assembly, because um, um, the governing uh, council um, of the United Nations uh, Environment Program was um, renamed. So uh, if you are perhaps coming across um, uh, older sources, uh, you have to see that governing council and the Environment Assembly uh, is, uh, is the same uh, organ, you could say, or the same um, institution within uh, UNEP. And uh, uh, 2012, we have uh, the United Nations Conference on Sustainable Development um, uh, and uh, uh, its adopted outcome document, The Future We Want. So this is uh, uh, basically the, um, well, the basis, the legal basis um, for, for this uh, development. And uh, in the uh, United Nations Environment Assembly, we have 193 member states. So you can see it is a, um, basically a more or less complete, uh, um, uh, well, institution representing interna the international community. And it is mandated to set the global environmental agenda to pro provide overarching, um, overarching policy guidance and uh, define policy responses to address emerging environmental challenges, to undertake policy review, dialogue, and the exchange of experiences, set the strategic guidance on the future direction of UNEP. We will come to this point in, the, in a minute because this is, of course, uh, important that uh, this um, is also the right place and the place mandated to define what UNEP is going to do in the future, which topics to take up, uh, and last but not least, and foster partnerships for achieving environmental goals and resource mobilization. And uh, uh, well, this is, as I've uh, uh, already indicated in the very beginning, uh, where, uh, um, uh, well, uh, my institution, for example, also comes in. Uh, we are a, a member to, uh, uh, to UNEA uh, in, uh, in the form of the um, observer uh, status, which allows us to, to uh, provide written contributions. We are not allowed to, to speak, 
or uh, uh, but we are uh, uh, and this is different from other UN uh, uh, contexts we are uh, allowed to actively on our own um, start to approach certain issues of importance and uh, to uh, share that uh, in this framework. We do have um, the uh, uh, latest uh, activity, which, uh, um, which uh, uh, well, took place this year. We do have resolution um, 612, the uh, resolution on environmental assistance and recovery in areas affected by armed conflicts. Um, this was, um, as one can imagine, um, um, well, handed in or um, supported a lot by Ukraine, um, and it was uh, uh, actually um, uh, not in the original wording. Obviously, there is a negotiation process, of course, so uh, that it can be um, uh, adopted. Um, so. Um, it's uh, it's an interesting paper to 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 read. Um, I I'm not sure. Do you share slides with the participants usually? I I usually yeah. wouldn't. Okay. Well, if there's a wish, I don't know. If there's a wish, you can of course uh, have access to the uh, to the uh, presentation um, or the. Uh, uh, well, the, the documents are not only for nice to see and uh, for illustrative reasons, but they are also uh, linked to the original documents in full text, so you can uh, have, uh, have a look into the, uh, the original documents if you, if you want to, uh, and also to have some understanding of the, the language used in in the international context, and I'm not sure if how many are interested in the in the future to work with or for the United Nations. So that might be nice to have a, uh, an understanding of how the the language is used in in the UN system. Um, a, a special um, a, a par paragraph from uh, well the uh, deductive, you could say, of my, my presentation here is uh, uh, para two, uh, which reads, invites states to take note of the International Law Commission's principles on protection of the environment in relation to armed conflict as applicable. Uh, so um, we will look into those, of course, uh, uh, to have a better understanding. One weak point is that state responsibility for wartime environmental damage is not mentioned in this resolution. Well, we have to see it, of course, in the uh, context of uh, the situation today. And you can imagine that uh, uh, one important, at least one important player wouldn't, wouldn't have liked to have a clear uh, well, saying on, on state responsibility in such a resolution. But as a, a, a statement, which I think was uh, um, uh, a nice and short, uh, clear statement uh, with regard to our, our issue here is there is no sustainable development without peace and no peace without sustainable development, which was mentioned in the uh, uh, joint global statement of major groups and stakeholders. This is basically the uh, representation of NGOs and non-state actors uh, in the, uh, in the um, context of the United Nations Environment Assembly. I would like to uh, look into the most recent developments um, and I've, um, I've thought of uh, um, uh, taking up two important um, steps which were taken uh, in the uh, last years, and that is first uh, the 2022 ILC principles on protection of the environment in relation to armed conflicts, 
and 2020, the ICRC guidelines on the protection of the natural environment in armed conflicts. So, um, yeah, let's start with the um, International Law Commission. And uh, um, this is, you can say, the first, well, if you, if you think about codifications, uh, they do not just come about, as you know, so they have to be negotiated. But in order to negotiate, you usually need uh, some kind of a, of a note paper, and something which is, uh, um, well, starting a discussion, and that usually is uh, presented um, uh, uh, in the past by learned societies. Nowadays, uh, uh, for example, the International Law Commission or other um, uh, international organizations might do that. Uh, in our case, we do... Bless you. Uh, in our case, we do have a UN General Assembly resolution on the protection of the environment in relation to armed conflicts. And this resolution includes the um, principles on protection of the environment in relation to armed conflicts um, per, uh, by the International Law Commission, um, which we are going to uh, look into a, a little in, in, in detail. I've also mentioned the link to the commentary in case somebody wants to, to uh, look into it more, more in detail, but uh, uh, I'm just going to, to give you some, some um, basic understanding here, of course, also because of the time restraints we have. Um, well, we do have principle 13, uh, general protection of the environment during armed conflict, which reads, the environment shall be respected and protected in accordance with applicable international law, and in particular, the law of armed conflict. And principle 16, prohibition of pillage. Pillage of natural resources is prohibited. So um, basically, this is uh, um, uh, something which uh, the ILC uh, uh, took took up um, and uh, um, you can you can see I've, I've just uh, 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 mentioned here the uh, um, uh, comment uh, made by by uh, by Germany uh, with regard uh, to the uh, principles uh, 13 and 16 um, uh, according uh, to this uh, comment uh, they imply an intrinsic value of the natural environment in or of itself, recognizing that attacks against the natural environment are prohibited unless it has become a military objective, as are reprisals against the natural environment. So basically, we, uh, uh, we uh, do see that uh, uh, by the uh, formulation, uh, by the wording of the ILC, uh, we um, see that uh, uh, it is now uh, shifting even more towards this protection of the environment, no matter if it is related to the human uh, uh, being or property or any other relationship. So um, there is a, um, well, a dogmatic discussion uh, among legal scholars of if um, there is a difference between in, of, or for itself. So, but I'm not going to share that with you. I only want to make sure that uh, you understand that there is still some way to go until there is a clear understanding on how to protect the environment, um, uh, as I said, in in itself, of itself, or for itself. So, but still, it is a, a big difference between environment as a property when we started with the, with the Hague Convention uh, until now, you could say, accepting or um, making uh, clear that uh, environment has a value uh, uh, in itself.
I would also like to mention an idea which I think is of, of um, uh, perhaps um, special interest. Um, we could take it also as uh, uh, one of the, uh, the uh, um, discussion points if you want to. I've also um, um, made another suggestion, but just to, to uh, um, introduce you or make you familiar with the uh, principle four regarding the designation of protected zones. Um, principle four reads, states should designate by agreement or otherwise areas of environmental importance as protected zones in the event of an armed conflict, including where those areas are of cultural importance. And uh, uh, um, principle 18, an area of environmental importance, including where uh, that area area is of cultural importance designated by agreement as a protected zone shall be protected against any attack except in so far as it contains a military objective such protected zone shall benefit from any additional agreed <laughs> protection so this is a, a concept which was uh, uh, developed uh, well not in in the armed conflict context but the protected zones is a concept which uh, uh, is, uh, uh, is in existence in uh, international environmental law with regard to, uh, for example, marine protected areas. But if you think about uh, Natura 2000 uh, network, we are speaking about um, uh, protected uh, areas on land, on, uh, on water, uh, underwater, uh, we are uh, having concepts of, um, uh, of uh, cultural heritage to be protected and many more. Uh, they have been uh, discussed over, over uh, basically, uh, well, I think three decades now. And it is interesting to see that they even now have access or enter the discussions in the context of uh, international humanitarian law. Um, and, uh, well, of course, you can uh, take a positive or a negative approach to that and saying, well, in wartime, they will not respect that. Um, but then, of course, uh, I, I do speak to, to participants here uh, in, a, in a program on IHL. So if we would take this approach, then uh, you could all go home, basically. So uh, I, I assume that you have a, a different attitude towards IHL and uh, also a different understanding of uh, how IHL influences positively uh, the um, uh, the uh, situation, basically, uh, of armed conflicts. But it is uh, something I would like, uh, I wanted to, to mention because uh, uh, I came across uh, uh, um, protected areas so many times during my, uh, during my career. So uh, I was uh, fascinated to see that, uh, that this also had access to IHL nowadays. Um, just shortly, I would like to um, uh, look into the uh, uh, ICRC guidelines uh, on the protection of the natural environment in armed uh, conflict, um, which, uh, as I said, was issued in uh, 20, 2020, uh, which it is, I have to warn you, uh, quite a, uh, well, quite a um, document like uh, Matt Vick, and, but it, it gives a very, very good overview uh, on, uh, on uh, IHL uh, and uh, the relationship to environment. So if you are interested, that's really a, a very interesting source uh, with uh, commentary and uh, uh, sources to, uh, to different uh, documents, resolutions, um, uh, jurisprudence and so on. So it's really nice to, to read. Um, I would like to mention particularly Rule 28 uh, on uh, repression of war crimes that concern the natural environment. 
um, which reads, states must investigate war crimes, including those that concern the natural environment, um, allegedly committed by their nationals or armed forces or on their territory, and if appropriate, prosecute the suspects. They must also investigate other war crimes over which they have jurisdiction, including those that concern the natural environment, and if appropriate, prosecute the suspects. Commanders and other su uh, superiors are criminally responsible for war crimes, including those that concern the natural environment committed by their subordinates if they knew or had reason to know that the subordinates were about to commit or were committing such crimes and did not take all necessary and reasonable measures in their power to prevent their commission, or if such crimes had been committed to punish the persons responsible. And C, individuals are criminally responsible for war crimes they commit, including those that concern the natural environment. And, well, you are perhaps asking why I'm, uh, well, giving this reference here to Rule 28, and um, I just didn't want to uh, stop my presentation also with regard to uh, the possibility of how to enforce basically uh, those rules, how really to to uh, hold, uh, um, um, well, states responsible, how to uh, hold individuals uh, 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 responsible or liable uh, uh, for uh, such, such crimes. And uh, uh, even though uh, you have mentioned during the uh, introduction that I would focus more on ecocide, I'm now doing some reference on that. So um, uh, coming, coming uh, uh, back to this and uh, building this full, full circle, you could say, I would like to um, uh, uh, show you what, what, is, uh, what is possible basically uh, nowadays. And uh, um, uh, you know that, uh, um, uh, well, uh, international criminal law um, uh, was, uh, was um, um, yeah, uh, or is, is based uh, on the uh, uh, Nuremberg and, and Tokyo uh, trials, which uh, developed an international criminal law uh, from um, uh, the, uh, um, well, uh, um, crimes committed during the Second World War, and uh, via the uh, um, via the uh, uh, um, ad hoc military tribunals for former Yugoslavia as well as uh, for Rwanda, and they they of course uh, uh, made the uh, um, reading ground, you could say, or the very basis for uh, the establishment of the International Criminal Court, but I guess that you have discussed that, so I don't have to, to uh, make any more references. So uh, when we uh, speak about the Rome Statutes, I would like to mention Article 8 on the war crimes, um, and uh, for the purpose of this statute, war crimes means um, other serious violations of uh, the laws and customs applicable in international armed conflict within the established framework of international law, namely any of the following acts, uh, um, and we do have uh, under, under four, uh, intentionally launching an attack in the knowledge that such attack will cause incidental loss of life or injury to civilians and damage to civil objects or widespread long-term and severe damage to the natural environment, which could be clearly excessive in relation to the concrete and direct overall military advantage anticipated. So uh, we do have a, um, a, a crime um, a category mentioned in the Rome Statute, which uh, uh, could, be, could be used and as uh, I'm uh, not uh, uh, following all the uh, uh, jurisprudence of the ICC, but as far as I know, so far this has not been uh, uh, used, um, but that is uh, um, uh, probably only a question of, of time 
if we if we look into the uh, most recent conflicts. Um, well, the, with regard to the uh, elements uh, of Article uh, 8, um, subsection 2b4, uh, I'm uh, just taking that, uh, taking that uh, out, of the, uh, of, uh, out of the elements. So this is uh, just for, for you to, to check uh, how, how it would go. Um, so uh, uh, even here, and this is why I've highlighted it again, uh, the additional harm to human interests is not required. So it is in line with the international community's approach towards um, uh, uh, the uh, well understanding or interpretation of environmental protection in, in armed conflicts nowadays. Um, I would like to mention just uh, shortly also the uh, draft convention of the Council uh, of, of, of Europe, um, which is uh, uh, not yet in force and uh, it is uh, taken as uh, uh, one uh, codific codification attempt, you could say, uh, with regard to uh, our, um, our issue, uh, meaning offenses related to severe widespread long-term environmental damage. And you can see that they have, uh, uh, well, taken up uh, to redefine the threshold, which is in existence uh, 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 in international law so far. So they have uh, started to, um, um, uh, to um, have different combinations, like here, uh, severe, uh, uh, and widespread, uh, severe and long-term, or severe and irreversible damage to the um, uh, human health or to the environment. So th there's a different approach. Perhaps uh, this allows, um, well, the, um, a consensus on, on the international level and still to lower the threshold without uh, being, um, well, uh, without going too low, you could say, to be applicable on, on too many cases. So it still has to have a certain severity, of course. Without that, we wouldn't, wouldn't uh, uh, be happy on the international scene if we have to deal with uh, too many uh, um, offenses, you could say. So uh, we'll see how that will go uh, in in the near near future. I've uh, also mentioned here um, the uh, revision on the on the uh, EU level. Uh, I'm not sure if uh, you have touched on that. Okay, um, there's a, um, a well well recent. Uh, and as you can see, still ongoing process in, in updating or revising uh, the, uh, the di directives uh, from uh, 20, 2008. So uh, that has to be updated uh, now. Um, and uh, it includes or should include now uh, even uh, offenses which go towards uh, um, uh, ecocide. But ecocide is is a word uh, or is a is a wording which is uh, uh, or which seems not to be too popular. Um, so um, they try to avoid. This wording, trying to um, uh, find a, a different definition on uh, this this type of uh, of offence, um, perhaps because there's a lack of a, of a common legal definition on ecocide. Um, so uh, we'll see if if um, perhaps this wording is is vanishing. Uh, or if it pops up again. But uh, this is now uh, an ongoing, ongoing process. Um, I think I have a second slide, yes. So uh, uh, it's in, uh, in first reading uh, at, the, uh, EU, uh, at the EU Parliament. 
And there uh, it says in, in the recitals, uh, so not in the, in the main part, you could say, of the directive, it says, whereas crimi one under uh, 21, criminal offenses relating to international conduct listed in this di directive can lead to catastrophic results, such as widespread pollution, industrial accidents with severe effects, on the environment or large-scale forest fires where such offenses cause the destruction of or widespread and substantial damage which is either irreversible or long-lasting to an ecosystem of considerable size or environmental value or a habitat within a protected site or cause widespread and substantial damage which is either irreversible or long-lasting to the quality of air, soil or water, such offen offenses leading to such catastrophic results should constitute qualified criminal offenses and consequently be punished with more severe penalties than those applicable in the event of other criminal uh, offenses defined in this directive. Those qualified criminal offenses can encompass conduct comparable to ecocide, which is already covered by the law of certain member states and which is being discussed in international fora. So, um, well, obviously we, we cannot touch really uh, the different national laws or national criminal laws here uh, for, for this uh, uh, purpose, uh, but uh, as, as it is mentioned, uh, this is already uh, uh, state of the art in certain um, member states and it is uh, going to be taken further in the um, in the European Union and of course uh, the European Union uh, can can make a difference of course by uh, implementing that into a, a EU or Union law so we'll see how that will develop in the in the near or middle term future so um, seeing that uh, we have uh, some uh, time restraints and I uh, allow myself to uh, um, uh, head towards the end, I would uh, just like to, to mention that um, uh, 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 environmental protection uh, in time of armed conflict, uh, as we have discussed uh, uh, now for the past more or less, uh, um, what is it? Uh, 60 90 minutes um, so uh, it is but it is not only um, that environmental damage is a result of a conflict but it may also be a cause of a conflict and this is as I've uh, said already in the very beginning there is a strong interrelationship between uh, the the topic we have touched uh, uh, today and um, uh, uh, the, uh, the question of um, uh, environmental security. So uh, perhaps this is also of, of, of interest to, uh, to you uh, to, uh, well, consider it a little further. I've given here some, some references, uh, particularly if we think about the triple planetary crisis uh, on climate change or biodiversity loss and environmental degradation, we will have to understand that this is also potential, or well, it's even beyond that, it is a threat to security. Uh, so environmental security does not, uh, or is not only discussed um, uh, in international fora like within the UN system, but it is also discussed within um, uh, specialized fora, for example, NATO. So I've uh, uh, given here the example of um, the um, NATO um, uh, Science for Peace and Secu Security program. Uh, just if you would like, um, uh, this picture is a, a, a video link for uh, explaining how, how NATO approaches uh, uh, environmental security. Uh, this is uh, 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 interesting to, to see how, uh, how, they, how they think about it. And uh, in 2023, NATO has uh, uh, established a center of excellence for climate change and security in Montreal, Canada, just as a 
uh, interesting uh, information here because it is an interesting source of information here, here as well beyond the uh, usual uh, NATO mandate. Last but not least, I have uh, one slide uh, of, a, of an issue which is um, uh, uh, an issue which sometimes is uh, forgotten, particularly since it is uh, sometimes not visible, uh, as for example, uh, uh, because of uh, uh, dumping of uh, munition and uh, military equipment uh, underwater. Uh, so remnants of the armed conflicts uh, is also uh, an issue which is uh, quite is interesting to, to read into it. Uh, please take it as a, as a kind of, um, well, motivation perhaps or uh, invitation to read into those uh, issues or to take it as, uh, as something which might, might be of interest for thesis or working stuff, whatever is of interest to you. Um, I think uh, we are, well, more or less done. So uh, I, I drop the, the question for discussion. Uh, some further, further reading, uh, as I said, I, I will uh, share the, the slides so you can have it. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.